and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico. Of course it is. And I'm here once again, all excited to welcome each and every one of you into the Puritan Barn, into the Now You See TV studios for the Midnight Ride with myself and John Pounders. Tonight, the tribe of Dan, the tribe of the serpent, we're going to take you on a ride tonight. This ride is going to segue in with a lot of the material that John brought forth on the last midnight ride. We are going to be on the Trail of the Serpent. There's going to be some marvelous revelations for the Israel of God. So get ready because it all starts right now because we are now live, live, live. What's up, guys? I've been waiting all week to say that. And we are here from the Puritan Barn. And we want to know how you guys are doing. Let us know in the chat if you guys are watching us live. And if you're not watching us live and you're just watching it from home, let us know in the comments. Make sure you subscribe so you can get more of this content. As David said, um, these, this trail <coughs> this trail that we're following, excuse me, it, it is uh, making David sneeze. It's so such a deep trail. But we've been, we've been following it last week, and we're following it this week. And it'll continue here for a while because I think we're on to something here. And this is just part of it, and I'm, I'm super excited about doing it. Before we get started tonight, though, I want to give a shout-out to all of our sponsors. Um, I want to start out with Joshua Watts Leather, WatchLeather.com. Um, amazing wet leather work. Uh, he's done several book covers for me, gun holsters. Uh, for a lot of you guys out there, he's done amazing work, and uh, for David, for all of us. So make sure you guys check that out if there's anything that you uh, like. As far as books goes and journal covers, I mean, these... I, I, I'm a book person, right? I love these things. So stuff like that is amazing to me. Also, we want to give a shout out to Sugar and Spice Soap Company, Natural Soaps. You don't have to worry about rubbing toxic uh, chemicals all over you. They even have a Midnight Ride brand just for you guys and a Midnight Ride box for you guys. Check it out over on SugarAndSpiceSoap.com. Um, we want to give a shout out to FOJC Radio, which is David and Donna's ministry where they've been pulling together information for a very long time. They've got stuff in their website from their books to their resources that they do on different shows. All of their stuff can be found right there in that one area. Also, if you if you haven't yet, check out NYSTV.org. You can find content that you won't find on YouTube that you won't find anywhere else because um, not only has some of it been banned, but some of it is content that uh, we've been working on for a very long time, like the Book of Enoch commentary, which um, we just added. We're just adding a new one to this one this week. We've added a new one. And so make sure you guys check that out. We're going to continue through that. We've got documentaries that most of most, they're not on anywhere else. Let's put it that way. You're not going to find them anywhere else because the, the kind of content that we produce isn't fit for the world. We're considered dangerous by the world. So make sure you guys check that out. Um, we have a couple shows coming up. David, I'll let you tell them about the show you guys have coming up tomorrow. Tomorrow night, 8 p.m. on FOJC Radio Rumble Channel. You can get there. Go to our website, FOJCRadio.com. There's an easy link right there to our Rumble Channel. 8 p.m. tomorrow night, Atlantis in America with myself and Brian Reese. Guaranteed you're going to come away from that broadcast all cool and frosty. Guaranteed. And just to let you guys know, so because people have been asking, we will not be having Breaking Babylon again this week. Um, and just, I don't know how much John wants me to disclose, but I just want to tell you to be in prayer for him. He's having a medical uh, problem right now, and he should be back with us here in the next couple of weeks. So be in prayer for him. 
Uh, I know he probably didn't want me telling all you guys that, but I'm going to do it anyway because we're two or more gathered in his name. He's there, and I think that it's important that people pray uh, for his speedy recovery. And so with that being said, David, um, I don't think I have anything else, and if I do, I'll run it back later. But I think tonight the people are here for one reason and one reason only, and that is to hear us get on the ride. Well, we're going to ride, and we're going to we're going to – be bringing forth some very profound things and as always we do it on the midnight ride in a way that you're probably not going to hear anywhere else but let's begin in genesis chapter 30 and verse 6 and rachel said god hath judged me and hath also heard my voice and hath given me a son therefore she called his name dan and there's a play on words here in the Hebrew. The, na the name Dan is, uh, when she said, God hath judged me in the Hebrew, that's Danan Nye. And it's a play on words that she named the child Dan because it is so similar to God hath judged me. And that's kind of an ominous uh, precursor of the role that the tribe of Dan is going to play. Now, in Numbers chapter 2, verse 25, when the children of Israel would camp and they, they would have their encampment, every tribe had their standard and every tribe would always be in the same place in relation to the tent of meeting in the Ark of the Covenant. And in De Numbers 2 and 25, the standard of the camp of Dan shall be on the north side by their armies and the captain of the children of Dan shall be a the son of a and it is very significant you know Lucifer wanted to ascend to the sides of the north it's here on the north side where we see the tribe of Dan in the in the camp of Israel and the great enemy of God that's going to come associated with horses comes from the north and we're going to see even more definitive connections between this end time enemy that comes from the north and the tribe of Dan now uh, just a little bit of clarification here and and what we're really saying here we are not looking for the restoration of Israel through genetics through trying to find some lost tribe scenario where they all get together and form Israel, that will always leave you out in the cornfield because the Israel of God is through faith in Christ. But what I am saying is that the genetic tribe of Dan, that it bore that Nephilim seed, and we're going to see this is the bloodline of the beast, not of the restoration of the Israel of God. And we're going to see very compelling evidence that that seed of Dan went into England. It also went in to the United States. Now, in Judges chapter 13, verse 7, it says, But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. And now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. And of course, this is speaking to us of Samson, who came from the tribe of Dan. Now, something that is just absolutely fascinating is that the we're going to do a little comparison between Dan and and Hercules. Now there was an actual Nephilim that lived before the time of Samson, and he was actually uh, one of these Nephilim that was worshipped as a god. And over time, the story that was written about Hercules in the myths of the pagan uh, languages, whether it be Greek or Roman, they began to take on the flavor of Samson. And Hercules was molded into a Samson figure. And that was for a reason. I believe that was for a reason, because they believed, the, the Israelites, the Christians, and the pagans believed that the final beast figure would come from this tribe of Dan. 
And also, I was reading some stuff too about you know them actually going to Greece and literally and literally being classified probably as Troy. You know the the the, the that whole area there. So that's I mean that would make sense that that would be a story associated with Greece. Yeah, because that you know anyways going just tracing some of the roots. I mean we have them there. Yeah, it absolutely does big time. Now, this is what Adam Clark says in his commentary, and there's about four pages of text on this, and I'll read just a little bit of it here. It says, uh, it has been made to appear that it was Samson, because of his prodigious and incomparable strength, that they forged their Hercules, first in Egypt, afterwards in Phoenicia, and lastly in Greece each of whose writers has united in him all the miraculous actions of others. It, it is the original and essential Hercules of fable, and, all the, the, and although the poets have united these several particulars, they are drawn from Moses and Joshua and have added their own inventions. And this, again, is not by coincidence. This is by design. And it's much the same as when Attila the Hun, he started the story of the King Arthur legend so that the people, he never made it to England, but he wanted the people of England to accept him as the beast of, of the Bible and of the scriptures. And the same thing here. These people are looking for the beast that is to come. And they wrote within this story of Hercules the characteristics of what this beast would be like when they appeared. These are two ancient instances of what we would call predictive programming. You know what's interesting about Attila the Hun, too, because I've been studying a lot more on him and his relation to Arthurian classics. He, they never found his body, and he died supposedly mysteriously, and nobody supposedly his body was buried uh, and hidden for a, or for a reason. So it's interesting to note that, too. I mean, I, you know, there's definitely a mystery around the death of Attila and, and how far he actually might have made it. Um, just because a lot of people associate Attila with actually being King Arthur, believe it or not. And I know it sounds crazy, but yeah, <laughs> and there's, there's valid reasons for doing that. Yeah. There's valid reasons for doing that. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't think so till you start digging and then you say, Oh man, <laughs> looky here. Yeah. And the, the association here of the Merovingian bloodline, the Merovingian bloodlines, they also have a strong association with the tribe of Dan. In this book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, it says the Merovingians were also frequently called the long-haired kings. Like Samson in the Old Testament, they were loath to cut their hair. Like Samson, their hair supposedly contained their virtue, the essence and secret of their power. Whatever the basis for this belief is the pursuance of the Merovingians' hair, it seems to have been taken quite seriously, and as late as A.D. 754, when Childeric III was deposed in that year and imprisoned, his hair was ritually shorn at the Pope's express command. And they understood it, and the Pope understood it, and just like Samson in the tribe of Dan, these guys believed that their power was in their hair. Uh, go on, it said, it says uh, they were regarded as priest kings, embodiments of the divine. In other words, not unlike, say, the Egyptian pharaohs, they did not rule simply by God's grace. On the contrary, they were apparently deemed the living embodiment and incarnation of God's grace. They literally believe themselves to be the incarnation of the, the wrong seed. And like Attila the Hun, you know, we would say, well, like who would want to be the Antichrist? And Attila the Hun, he claimed to be the Antichrist and he wanted people to believe he was. He wanted to exterminate Christianity. And we see the same association here in the Merovingian kings that are just, you know, you've got the long hair and there's even more. 
there's even more deeper associations that show us that the, this Merovingian bloodline knew and understood that they did bear within them that Nephilim seed that was transmitted from the tribe of Dan. And it says here, this is on page 108 of this book, Holy Blood, or no, this is Guardians of the Grail, but J.R. Church. It says King Merovi, and he is the guy that began the Merovingian dynasty. One, and from this Merovingian, you can trace the Habsburgs and all of the, the two doors, all of the royal bloodlines can be traced from their start here in the Merovingians. And King Merovi supposedly possessed magical powers. He and his royal offspring wore their hair long as a symbol of their magic, similar to Samson. It was also they that had the power to heal by the laying on of hands, and that power could be found in the tassels that hung as fringes on the bottom of their garments. This indicates a possible Hebrew heritage. Well, yeah. Uh, so where, why were these guys, these Merovingian kings, they were wearing long hair, they would wear teat seats, they believed themselves to be a divine incarnation of that bloodline that would bring forth the, and they would say, you know, well, it's the good Messiah, but it's absolutely the beast that they had the seed within them bearing the beast. Now, also it says here, and this is another one of the symbolic identifications. It says the symbolic nature uh, and, and it says here, we're going to show you a couple coronation gowns one of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte and one of uh, Marie Louise Habsburg and their coronation ground, gowns. And it says here, when the tomb of Childric I, son of Merovi, was discovered and opened in 1653, there were found among the items in his tomb 300 miniature bees made of solid gold. And here we can see this is Napoleon Bonaparte that has the bees upon his gown. And we see also uh, Marie Habsburg, and she has the same bees upon her gown. Well, what and how does that connect with the tribe of Dan? Well, let's go to the scripture here in Judges chapter 14, verse 14. And he said unto them, out of the eater came forth the meat, and out of the strong came forth the sweetness. And they could not in three days expound the riddle. Look at your neighbor and say, this is a riddle. This is a riddle. Now let's read the next text. And the men of the city said unto him, On the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey, and what is stronger than a lion? And he said unto them, If ye had not plowed my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle. And the key to the riddle of Samson was the honey and the honeybee. And we see, and this is another, the beehive in Freemasonry. In the Blue Lodge of Freemasonry, one of the symbols is the beehive. And here we have this bee, which is the clue to Samson's riddle. And this is on the coronation gowns of these people that associate themselves with this, with this bloodline. Now, in this next text here, Daniel 8.23, we did an entire midnight ride on this text. It says, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up now just take a guess if you would look that phrase dark sentences up in the hebrew guess what that means riddle riddle there's going to be someone stand up a fierce king and he is going to understand the riddle well what is the answer to the riddle that from remote antiquity, there have been elite bloodlines that have 
believe themselves to be preparing the way for the beast and these different uh, bloodlines and that we're talking about the elite royalty of Europe, the Merovingians, the Habsburgs, uh, they're all, they are all tied in there. And we can see this, this symbolism of the bee. We see it on their, on their coronation gowns. And we see this also as a symbol in Freemasonry, which is going to be very, very significant as we continue to unpack this. Now, in 2 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 25, but in all Israel, there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And we know the story of Absalom. When Absalom rebelled and tried to drive, uh, well, he did. Uh, King David was driven from Israel for a while. And in 2 Samuel 14, 25, here's something very significant about Absalom. And in the story of Absalom, this was nothing less than a satanic attempt to set the Nephilim seed on the throne of David. Nothing less than that. And one of the key uh, distinctives of Absalom was his hair. But in all Israel, there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. Now, we just read that, John. Oh. Let's go to verse 18. Oop, okay. Let me... I, I don't think I have 18 on the slides here, David. I'm sorry. Okay, that's all right. Uh, let me pull up here. I've got a Bible with pages here. How about uh, that? I have to go old school. Yeah, we'll just go <laughs> old school on them here. We'll just, just look it up on our King Jimmy. And uh, this will be Second Samuel... And uh, no, let me see. Judges, Second Samuel, fourteen twenty-five. Yeah, I don't. Fair. That's it, David. That's the one we. Uh, that's the one you just read. Yeah, but there's one here. Uh, I think it's verse twenty-eight. It talks about his hair. And let me see if I can't find it. I'm not gonna. Uh, yeah, verse twenty-six. Second Samuel fourteen twenty six. It says, and when he pulled his head, for it was at every year's end that it that he pulled it. He got a haircut once a year, because the hair was very heavy on him. Therefore he pulled it. He weighed the hair of his head at two hundred shekels after the king's weight. Absalom, absolutely, was long-haired he bore that distinctive and that association not only with the tribe of dan but with that nephilim bloodline and this isn't a maybe so we're going to show you that's exactly what was going on here now this is talking about the genealogy of the sons of david in second samuel 3 and 3 and his second Ch 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 chaliab of abigail the wife of nabal the carmelite and the third, Absalom, the son of Makkah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Gesher. Now, the little kingdom of Gesher was right at the foot of Mount Hermon. It was right by and it was absorbed by the kingdom of Bashan. And he, uh, the name there, she was the daughter of Talmai. And Talmai is one of the names of the ancient Nephilim kings. And this goes back to the original children of Anak that were in Hebron. And David conquered Hebron and drove out the Anakim. And it says here, Numbers 13, 22, And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ahimon, Shehai, and Talmai, there it is, the children of Anak. And Talmai was a designation and a name of these ancient kings of the Nephilim there in Bishan and at the foot of Mount Hermon. And David, I mean, this is just a big lesson here. You've got to be careful who you married. And David opened the door up 
for this his own little self. But the devil, uh, when he opened up the door, he ran through it uh, with all of his might. But we want to think about this. There's a lot of designations here. We've got this absolute of uh, identification here and the association of the long hair with the Nephilim kingly line. This goes back to the tribe of Dan, where they made basically their anti-Samson as their uh, anti-Messiah. Now we're going to go back. What, John? That, that was, sorry, that was the audio playing there for oh, the video. Oh, I thought here, you so. said that was the audio pop. Okay. But what we're going to do, we're going to go back in, going to get in the midnight ride time machine and we're going to go back to a midnight ride we did called the Ten Bloodlines of the Satanic Kings. And we're going to show an association that we drew of the long hair of the traditional Jesus. And this is how Jesus was pictured by these Renaissance artists. And they would draw him with this long hair. And well, just watch. Just watch here if possible. And this is a picture, uh, a traditional picture of Jesus. And my question is, who is this really a picture of? Uh, it's not a picture of our Lord and Savior, the real Son of God, but I would submit to you that this is the picture and the artist rendition of of the other Jesus, the Jesus of the Despacini, that they will one day want to set upon the throne of global government. And go to the next slide here, John. And uh, the question there is, who is this? And this is a fella by the name of David Mayer Rothschild. He is of the British Rothschilds, and as you can see, he looks just like Jesus. Now, wait a minute. No, he doesn't look just like Jesus, but he looks just like the Jesus as it has been portrayed by these Renaissance artists that were most always Luciferian and homosexual, and they have painted this picture of Jesus that has been accepted by the masses, which is not the real Jesus, but this is the Jesus of this counterfeit Luciferian Despacini. And here we have David Rothschild, who is now in his 40s. He's of the British Rothschilds, and he looks just like this counterfeit Despacini Jesus. And it's by design. We might say that it is by genetic design, and it's obvious that Mr. Rothschild does everything he can to present himself as the image of this Despacini Jesus, the image of the beast, we might say. And his nickname is actually the Plastic Jesus. And that's his nickname, the Plastic Jesus, because he so obviously wants to portray himself in this manner. And I... So what do you say, John? Is this a coincidence that Plastic Jesus is over there? Does this have any more significance after we learned the things that you brought forth in your last presentation? I think so, man. Did you notice, too, on that picture there, that uh, that belt buckle he's wearing there? At, um, it's like a skull and crossbones right there on his on his belt buckle. Do you see that? Ah, well, how about that? I didn't notice that the first, well, first time we did that. Well, how about that little, little Knights Templar symbol yeah. there? All right. All yeah, right. and that the interesting, too, like Rothschild means red shield. And the whole red the thing that you'll get into probably here in a little bit really rings a bell. Yeah, yeah, yeah it really does. That, that symbolism, uh, it runs deep. And I tell you what, this is running deep. It's running real deep. There are things here that... Uh, have been being prepared by the demonic spirits. And, you know, it's with the help of the Holy Spirit that, we, you know, Jesus said there's nothing hidden that won't be revealed. It's with the help of the Holy Spirit that John and I are able to uh, come upon these things and to reveal them. And these things are buried, and they're buried real deep, and it's hard to connect the dots. But the Bible says that 
in the end time, there's going to be a king stand up yep. that's going to understand the riddle. Yeah. And he's going to, uh, he's going to understand it. He's going to step in the driver's seat and drive the car here. Yeah. I, I really believe that, man. And, you know, we're starting to see this stuff just being portrayed right in front of us. Just the whole, the whole idea of the, you know, you were talking about how they wanted to portray themselves as the, the grace of God on earth, the whole chivalry movement, right? The whole idea of the chivalry and how they portrayed the British royalty as chivalrous um, through King Arthur legends and everything is really interesting. And Rothschild, of course, plays a huge role in that family as well. They, um, they've been one of the, what I believe, what I believe is like about the Rothschilds is they were, you know, we talked about these people on the shows. We talked about the Scythians. We talked about that. Um, one of the Khazarian tribes, when that book 13th tribe by Kostler, I believe it was, he talks about how the Khazarians were actually the bankers for the Royals always. They had, yeah. they would, they would make them cause they were smart. They were really smart and they knew how to get the money right in the land. And then they yeah. would eventually once the, they grew really, really rich, they would take back the money from them and, and yeah. somehow and do that and dissipate it. So like, this is like Rothschilds is the current day, I believe Khazarian, you know, banksters to yes. these people, just like they were back in the day. And the people that invented the modern banking system were the Knights Templar. Yes. And here we got yep. the, the skull and crossbones. See, all of these things are symbols that are there for the people that uh, are in the know. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's time for the people of God to be as understanding, uh, to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. And uh, it, it's amazing to me. And it, it is uh, when you see these things and, you know, why would there be a skull and crossbones there? Well, that's a message. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we, you know, we've we spent a lot of time. You wonder, well, uh, is it uh, is it Israel? Are they going to be? And, you know, you brought out a lot of teachings where Israel is called the harlot. The book of Ezekiel, yeah. uh, the United States, you know, we control the biggest military who can make war with the beast. Yeah. And then we have England, all the things that you brought out. Well, who's the beast a B or C. And I think we're going to begin to understand that instead of the answer being a B and C it's D all of the above. <laughs> all of the above. And we could get some, I think some profound understanding. I know I've never seen this before, but some things we're going to share with all of you tonight where I, I think it might begin to really make some sense. But in Genesis 49, 49, Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son. Thou art gone up, he stooped down, and he couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Judah, the tribe of Judah, represented as a lion. And we know that Jesus was the lion from the tribe of Judah, but also in Scripture in Genesis 49, 17, and 18, we're going to see that Dan is represented not only as a serpent, but also as a lion's whelp. And it says in Genesis 49, 17, and 18, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels so that his riders shall fall backwards. Dan, biblically associated with the serpent. And in scripture, we see the total apostasy of the um, tribe of Dan. We can read that in the book of Judges, how they turned away and they went totally uh, into apostasy. And I'm going to read another scripture for you here before we go to Mr. Mackey. And Albert Mackey is uh, him and Mr. Pike and Mr. Hall. They are the all-time uh, elite Masonic authorities. And I want to read in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 9 another text about the tribe of Dan. And it says here, Judah and that's the one I just read. Okay. All right. Now there's a text. There's another one about the lion's whelp, I believe. That, that well, you have it in says, here. and I think we'll get to it. It says Dan is a lion's whelp. That is, uh, we'll get to that here in just a minute. Um, 
there, uh, that's here. Judah. Yeah, Dan. He, there yeah, there, Deuteronomy thirty three twenty two, and we'll get to that, in uh, and talk about that in just a minute. While, well, while you're looking at the book, uh, David, I was going to show something too, which is interesting because rem- I, I don't know if you remember this sh- this show that we did uh, about uh, Omicron. Remember when they came out oh, with yeah. Omicron? So I'm going to try to pull this up and just see if I can. Yeah, you get right it just for while you're looking there. So the, there's this the constellation that happened. It happened when they pronounced Omicron as one of the variants. And during that time, all of the people that are uh, part of the World Economic Forum and the money system, they all went to at, uh, uh, at Antarctica to view a um, eclipse that happened in Ophiuchus, which is the serpent constellation and interestingly like that verse you just read david all of these and you're going to probably get to this but all of them are mentioned all of these tribes are mentioned as part of the Maseroth. and yes. that 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 particular statement that he made could be looked at as well as a constellation um <laughs> uh, absolutely uh, of yeah you know yeah so anyways i just wanted to bring that forth i don't know you may have been ready to say that and i apologize well so. no but absolutely this is what the freemasons did and the occultists before the freemasons they they associated the tribes of israel with the zodiac yeah and dan was associated with the serpent and also with the eagle now uh in Mackey's encyclopedia it says one of the 12 tribes of Israel whose blue banner charged with an eagle is born by the grand master of the first veil in a royal arch chapter. Now, in Freemasonry, you have the Blue Lodge, the first three degrees, the entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason. And after that, the two most popular options in the United States is the Scottish Rite or the York Rite. Now, in the York Rite, in the seventh degree, it is called the Royal Arch Degree. And this is specifically associated with the tribe of Dan and with a blue banner uh, charged with an eagle. And there's, and I believe, of course, there's, there's a big reason for that. Now, let's look at something very interesting. And if you want to drive a free if you're a little feisty like i am and you want to uh aggravate freemasons i think freemasons are just given for us to have fun with i think uh not that there isn't a very serious side to their evil but you can write out j-a-h hyphen b-a-l hyphen o on and if it's a york right freemason just say you know how do you pronounce that can you tell me how to pronounce that <laughs> and of course that's gonna uh, send them turning flips because this is one of the nastiest secrets of Freemasonry as we will show you. Jeremiah 19 and 5 says that little children were sacrificed unto Baal. And it says here in this Masonic ritual, it explains the secret name of God in this York Rite degree, or excuse me, the Royal Arch degree in uh, the York Rite, the seventh degree. It says, Jah, the name of God, found in the 68th Psalm. Baal, or Bel, this word signifies a lord or master and possessor. Hence was applied by many of the nations to the east to denote the lord of all things. And on, this was the name which Jehovah was worshipped among the Egyptians. So their name for God is a Mr. Potato Head, three-headed uh, beast. And it's interesting that there are three heads to this beast. And there are three names put together that form this name of God in the Royal Arch Degree. Now, you're familiar with a fella uh, by the name of Aleister Crowley. And Mr. Crowley was about as bad as bad gets. I mean, he was heralded in the British tabloids during his lifetime as the most evil person in the world. Now, in his uh, confessions, which is his autobiography, on page 771, Mr. Crowley wrote this. I supposed myself to have reached the summit of success when I restored the secret word of the royal arch. In this case, tradition had preserved the word almost intact. 
hacked. It required only a trifling change to reveal it in all its radiant royalty. Mr. Crowley figured out the riddle. You see, this is a riddle. It's a riddle that in this York Rite, this name of God, this Mr. Potato Head three-part beast, that this is the riddle of the final name and revelation of the beast. This is what this king of fierce countenance is going to understand. And right after Crowley was initiated in the royal arch and understood the real meaning of the word, guess what he started calling himself? The Beast 666. Mm. Coincidence? Well, we don't believe in him here. Uh, you know, it's interesting, David, and I was I w- wonder if you came across anything like this in your studies. So I've, I've noticed, too, that Dan and Phoenicia are almost interchangeable sometimes in history when it comes to who they are and what they represent. That Dan and the Phoenicians? The Dan and the Phoenicians. And I know at one time they they joined forces, and of course Israel did too several times. You know, you have Jezebel and uh, King Ahab and, and them joining forces. Now, the Phoenicians were always known for an eagle at one time. Yes. You're, and and so I'm wondering, you know how you have the griffin that's almost like a— it's almost like a dragon eagle in a way. I'm wondering if that represents the union of those two things. If, did you read anything like that? Because it's interesting. I have. You. Okay. And, All right. And Emmanuel Velikovsky, he says that the Phoenicians were just apostate Israelites. Yeah. That their blood, they were genetic Hebrews that had just you know gone yeah. into their own thing and totally renounced all of the worship of the hebrews and we're going to see a connection and the phoenicians were the great sailors yes they were the ones that enabled solomon to have the great navy yes we're going to also see a scripture about dan remaining in ships Very and cool. the connection between dan and the phoenicians who velikovsky says they're just israelites anyway yeah because at one time because uh, i noticed that at one time the phoenicians were you know, at the time of Solomon, they were a separate thing. And then at one time, they all kind of just merged the tri- northern tribes and Dan and all that merged with these people. Very interesting. Yeah, it is. And there's absolutely something uh, that is very profound to it. Now, this, whether you know it or not, was the original American flag. This was the original American flag. It's called the Gadsden flag of the American Revolution. It was adopted 1775. Then, in 1782, the bald eagle was adopted as the official emblem of the United States. Now, note, and I believe there's a real spiritual signature here. Now, the tribe of Dan in Genesis 49 represented as a serpent. The Freemasons and the occultists, they took the tribe of Dan and give it, they, they associate it with the, the second heaven, heavenly luminaries, and they represented it as an eagle. Dan went from a serpent to an eagle. The United States, in its symbolism, it went from a serpent on the Gazden flag to the bald eagle officially in 1782. I believe there's a spiritual signature there associating america with the tribe of dan i think so too you know i saw there was at, when we had our event here at the pier tomorrow in the pentecost there was a guy wearing a shirt with that symbol on it but instead of it saying don't tread on me it says i give you the power to tread on serpents <laughs> and i was like man that is the coolest yeah. shirt i've ever yeah. seen because yeah. that's that's my I, like me personally i'm i don't want to associate myself with a serpent by wearing a shirt like that but that one was like you know that that was on point i like that i and i can't i'm so sorry i don't remember your name but um that shirt was amazing yeah that's the way we like to associate serpents with our foot on their head yeah Yeah. now this is a book entitled the end of the anglo-saxon age and there's something uh that we want to read from this and this is something John got into this history of in his last presentation. And there are strong, definitive, undeniable connections between British royalty. And here again, this is bloodline stuff between the British royals and the tribe of Dan. And, of course, it's easy to see when we 
make that rock solid connection between the tribe of Dan and England, it's easy to see how that comes right into America. Because, uh, yeah, that's where we come from. Uh, and this is where the, uh, that Masonic early heritage came. And, but I'll just read a little bit here. And it talks about, it says here, but have you heard of the stone of destiny, Leophel, the stone of Skan, the stone of Bethel, Jacob's pillar? During the British Empire, had you gone to Westminster Abbey to see the coronation chair of the British monarchs, you would have seen a large pillow-shaped stone weighing 336 pounds and measuring 26 inches by 16 inches by about 11 inches. And by the way, what you had there were three sixes, believe it or not. Uh, if you just look in the numbers of the dimensions of this, you get a good 666 there, which we shouldn't be surprised about that anyway, should we? But it says uh, that this was under the seat of the coronation chair. And this stone of Skan, it was the belief of the British royals that when they were uh, like when old Prince Charles here very recently when he was made the King of England they believe that they are sitting upon the throne of David and that they are the head of the Davidic dynasty that is absolutely what these people believe yeah. Now, we've got a little, want to read a little bit here. John read from this book also in his last Midnight Ride and The Antichrist and a Cup of Tea by Tim Cohen. And he, he says here, I'll read just a little bit on page 87. He says, according to the doctrine of Anglo-Israelism, which the author fully rejects, and he said, Great Britain and the United States are both significantly populated by the so-called lost ten tribes of Israel. I also agree with Mr. Cohen 100%. I wholeheartedly reject this. We, and this is something that Herbert Armstrong and the uh, Armstrong Church of God, they believed that uh, in the American England being the lost tribes of Israel, and they were they were looking for a restoration of Israel through genetics. Anytime you get into any of these, well, let's hunt the lost tribes and we'll see how Israel's going to be restored. That's always wrong because Israel is a spiritual construct of the spirit, those that have faith in Christ. They are the seed of Abraham. And that just covers up the truth that we need to see that what these genetics are going to restore and bring about is not the restoration of the Israel of God, but of the anti-Israel, the anti-Christ, the anti-Messiah. It's the genetics of the beast which is being brought forth by this bloodline that came from the tribe of Dan carrying this Nephilim seed right from the foot of Mount Hermon. I think that's an important distinction you made there, too, because people are always looking for, you know, the black people are Israel, this, the white people are Israel, these people are Israel, and ultimately it always has boiled down to a spiritual thing 100%. Now, uh, genetically, maybe they match some genetics, but what does that even mean in the whole scheme of things? Because the Bible says that a Jew is one inwardly, yeah. not outwardly, right? And so, yeah. um, and, and is it any coincidence that the whore that rides the beast is... Uh, Basically, the only whore that you see in the entire Bible is Israel, right? They're the yeah. ones that whored out and yeah. got divorced from the kingdom. So it's not a good, not necessarily a good thing to be associated with genetic Israel. Always, we need to be associated with the the blood of Jesus, genetic Israel, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So, and that takes us right back to the foot of Mount Hermon, where the tribe of Dan totally hoarded out and intermingled themselves at the foot of the mountain where the watchers came down. I'll read just a little bit more here. Uh, this, and this is something I think John probably covered this. We'll read it again. It says, David's throne, the statement at the bottom of Queen Elizabeth II's official Anglo-Israelite lineage, nevertheless reads, quote, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Now, she is not sitting upon the throne of David, but she thinks she is. 
and O King Charlie. He thinks he is. And there was an even a um, a segment done by an Israeli television station celebrating the actual Hebrew genetic connection with what was then Prince Charles. Now, goes on to say, uh, Elizabeth II was anointed and crowned at her coronation as Queen of Thy People Israel. Prince Charles and his mother hold that the throne upon which the king was crowned, the famous coronation chair at Westminster Abbey in London, is the rightful throne of Israel's King David. They asserted that it had Jacob's headstone on which he rested his head at Bethel for its base. Legend has it that the prophet Jeremiah took this 336-pound stone called the Stone of Destiny to Ireland, used there for a coronation throne. The stone was then brought to Scone, pronounced Scone, in Scotland, where for a millennium until 1296, Scottish kings were crowned. So we have just an absolute, undeniable association between the, the Brits and the Israelites that they believe that they're on the throne of David. Now, this is a scripture that we've kicked around a little bit here on the Midnight Ride. It just keeps coming back to me. And in 2nd Asterisk 11 and 1, Then saw I a dream, and behold, there came up from the sea an eagle, which had twelve feathered wings and three huts. And there's a text a little bit later in 2nd Asterisk 11 where the right head of the eagle eats the left. And I've said that it is impossible to resist the uh, symbolism there of relating that to the United States and the right-hand path, if you will, the MAGA eating the left. It's just irresistible to make that comparison. But what about this? And this is the way prophetic scriptures are. They have layers of understanding and layers of interpretation. It just doesn't, it'll mean something to the people when it was written. And as this scripture unpacks through history, there are layers of understanding of that flow from this one text. Now, let's, it, it's irresistible not to relate that eagle symbolism to the United States. But now I find it equally irresistible not to relate this to the tribe of Dan, who is also represented by the eagle. Dan went from the serpent symbology to the eagle. The United States went from the serpent symbology to the eagle. Now, let's think about it in this way for just a moment. And by the way, Adam, bless your heart, and thank you for making us this slide. And let's just see if we might be able to understand the symbolism here of the three-headed eagle in 2nd Asterisk 11 a little bit like this. And of course, in the center, we have Israel. And of course, Israel, that's where it began in the tribe of Dan, where it apostatized, and uh, they were called, in the Bible, they're called the harlot. Now, on the right-hand side there, we have England, and as we've just read to you, England believes that they are the sitting upon the throne of David. They are not, but what they are, they're bearing that Nephilim seed within that royal bloodline. And by the way, I threw out that word Despacini. And by the way, go back and watch that 10 Bloodlines Midnight Ride. I guarantee you, you'll come away from that all cool and frosty also. That was, I don't care if me and John did it, that was a great presentation. You need to go watch it. Um, and 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 here we have the right, this, this eagle on the right side. And of course, it gave birth to the eagle on the left, the other head of the eagle, which was the United States. And we have that spiritual signature. Yes, they went from the serpent to the eagle, just like the original head in the middle. So we see here now, the symbolism of the three heads of the eagle represented by Israel, Great Britain, and the United States. And if this be correct, the right head of the eagle eating the left would symbolize 
the control that this bloodline from Dan would exert over all the earth. And also we could talk about how all of the American presidents, except maybe two, are descended from a British king. We got that too. But let's just say for a minute here that, uh, and, and how could that happen? Well, if Prince Charles is really uh, pulling the strings there at Davos, and if what Mr. Coleman said about the Committee of 300, that he is running through uh, controlling people on the board of Fortune 500 corporations, and that was Mr. Coleman who come from MI6. He wrote this book, The Committee of the 300, and that's what the guy claimed. And the more I look, the more sense it makes. Could it be, John? Could it happen? Is it is it something we need to maybe think about that the right head of this eagle, Great Britain, could eat the left head? Hmm. I, I mean, I think so. Because, I mean, when you look at, I mean, the power that England has is underestimated always big time. It has been for a long time. Of course, it shouldn't be knowing that they own over one quarter of the world's land and resources or, or the, I'm sorry not land but the countries of the world they own uh, over one quarter of them and uh, also what makes them powerful is the the king is the head of freemasonry he appoints the head grandmaster of freemasonry and there's light and dark freemasonry as we know they represented on the checkerboard as the light and dark patches of the checkerboard through the order of the garter he runs the right and the left order of the checkerboard right he runs the dark side of the checkerboard and the light side through the order of the garter because the leader of the order of uh, the the leader of the french freemasonry guess what he's a member of the order of the garter and so it's it's really interesting he controls all of that and so this guy not only has impeccable lineage man-made lineage but he also has impeccable beastly lineage and to a point to where if anybody's going to understand dark sentences it's going to be one of them yeah <laughs> They could know the meaning of the riddle, couldn't they? Yeah. Yeah. And um, and that's just a you know theory, of course, but yeah, a, a good one maybe. I, don't I know. think it's something we need to be aware of, and I think it's – and, you know, we, we, it, it's not good to be overly dogmatic. Right. Uh, because uh, it could very well be one of the presidents of the United States, or yep. it could be while one of the presidents of the United States is some stumbling, falling down, walk across the stage that – our power could be stripped from us by the manipulation of the globalists. Yeah. Already, uh, there there has been an accord. There has been an accord signed just about a week or so ago that in one year is going to surrender the national sovereignty of the United States to the WHO yeah. in any kind of a, of a pandemic emergency. It's really a treaty, and treaties should be ratified by a two-third vote of the Senate. But this is just, well, we'll just call it an accord, and we'll just... Uh, will just give away our national sovereignty. So the next time a super bug gets loose, it won't be the mayor, it won't be the governor, or the president will decide uh, what to do in the lockdown. It'll be the, the boys from Davos, yep. you know, and the WHO. So we, we can just see how that's setting up. So true. Now, let's look at the uh, writings of Irenaeus, and we can buttress this with the fact that it was the predominant opinion in the early Antonicene church being before the Council of Nicaea in the fourth century that they believed that the beast would come from the tribe of Dan. I will cite Irenaeus, and this is on volume one of the Antonicene Fathers, and this is found on page 559. And Irenaeus, who was born in the second century, uh, he said this, and Irenaeus was taught by Polycarp, who was taught by the Apostle John. So we got a pretty pretty uh, good connection there. But Irenaeus wrote this. He says, And Jeremiah does not merely point out his sudden coming, but he even indicates the tribe from which he shall come, where he says, We shall hear the voice of his swift horses from Dan. The whole earth shall be moved by the voice of the neighing of his galloping horses. He shall also come and devour the earth and the fullness thereof, the city also, and they that dwell therein. This, too, is the reason that this tribe is not mentioned in the apocalypse. 
along with those that are sta- saved. And also the tribe of Ephraim was admitted, because also, as in Hosea it said, Ephraim is joined unto her idols. Leave them alone. And uh, and the Ephraim and I'm waking, when Ephraim wakes up, it's going to bring forth the beast. You know, that's not what the... Um, the people that subscribe to let's go find the lost tribes and restore Israel people. It's going to really just totally jack you up and cause you to miss this. Now, if you remember in Genesis 49, the scripture said that Dan is a serpent in the way that will bite with the horse's heels. And here again, we have this association with Dan in the north and Dan and the horse's heels. And uh, in Jeremiah 8 and 16, this is the scripture that was quoted by not only Irenaeus, but also we're going to read from uh, Hippolytus. And they associated this with the tribe of Dan. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones. And they are come and have devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell in. This was the text that was quoted by Irenaeus in relating this to the tribe of Dan. And we had this scripture here not long ago on a midnight ride, Jeremiah 6, 22 and 3. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the north. And in we've showed here this evening how that the alignment of the tribe of Dan associated with the north and the north side, the sides of the north, okay. And this again associates this enemy from the north. And Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the north country, and a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. They shall lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel. They have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea, and they ride upon horses set in array as men for war against the old daughters of Zion. Kind of sounds a lot like we got over and over as we studied the Scythians that this association with horses. This, this association over and over again, and like John has made mention tonight, there are serious connections between the tribe of Dan and the Scythians, which is beyond our purview to unpack, but it's real and it's there, I guarantee you. And that goes right from there to Attila the Hun, back to England. These are unmistakable dots that connect over and over and over and are all pointing in the same direction. Now, in Genesis 49 and 9, Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down and couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall raise him up? Judah is called a lion's whelp. And in the scripture, in Deuteronomy 33, 22, and of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. Now, Judah's a lion, Dan is a lion. And we see the tribe of Dan as an imitation of the tribe of Judah. And actually, you know, everyone did not apostatize from the tribe of Dan. And the Danites that stayed true to the God of Israel, they were assimilated into the tribe of Judah. Very interesting, isn't it? He, and here, this last part is so significant. He shall leap from Bashan. Now, what does it mean when it talks about the tribe of Dan leaping from Bashan? Now, we're going to show another little Masonic connection here and why the number 33 is so important to Freemasons. And in the occult world, the number 33, it is related to the 33 spines of the vertebrae raising the serpent kundalini fire up the spine into the third eye, the opening of the, uh, the third eye and the pineal gland. Now, the rigid, this is where it starts, and they're still really sore about this. Joshua chapter 12. Now, these are the kings of the land which the children of Israel smote and possessed their land on the other side of the Jordan toward the rising of the sun from the river Arnon unto Mount Hermon and all the plains of the east. And on the east side, there were two kings that were subdued. King Sihon of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon and ruled from Aor, which is upon the bank of the river Arnon, and from the middle of the river, and from half Gilead, even under the brook Jabbok, which is the border of the children of Ammon. And from the plain to the sea of Chinneroth on the east, and to the sea of the plain, even the salt sea on the east, the way to Beth Shemoth, and from the south under, you say it. I'm not even going to try that. <laughs> and the coast of 
Og, the king of Bashan, which was the remnant of the giants that dwelt at Ashtaroth and Edrai. So bottom line, east of the Jordan, two kings drove out. Now, Joshua 12, 24, on the west side of the Jordan, and the kings of, and it gives a big long list of all of them, and it winds up saying, and the king of Tizra won, and the kings 30 and 1. 31 kings driven out on the left side of the Jordan, two on the right. We got the number 33. This is the number of Nephilim kings in the kingdom that was set up uh, there in the Levant when Joshua went in and uh, dethroned 33 of them. That's why the number 33, this is huge in Freemasonry, and uh, this is the real basis of where that come from. Now, Deuteronomy 3 and 11 for only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Raboth of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it after the cube, cubit of a man. Now, only Og remained of the remnant of the Rephaim. Now, they show up later down with the uh, Philistines there in the days of Goliath. We see more Rephaim. But there in Levant, they took off because they knew they were going to get a little, uh, that uh, there was going to be a little smash mouth played with them by Joshua and the Israel of God. So, this, and you know, how does Dan leap from Bashan, Judges 517, Gilead abode beyond Jordan, and why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breech breaches. Dan remained in the ships. Dan leaped from Bashan. And when this evacuation of the Rephaim at the time of Joshua, when they fled the tribe of Dan and all just John was relating here. We were talking about the relationship between the Phoenicians and the tribe of Dan and how that Velikovsky said, you know, these Phoenicians, they're just genetic Israelites gone apostate, which is exactly what they were. So what we have here is that Dan getting in ships and exiting stage left at this very time. Now, something you want to say there, John, before we go on? I mean, it just makes perfect sense. You know, you have the, the Saxons, the Sea Kings. Um, that would have been the only way. They probably would have made it out of destruction and, and um, going into captivity. Uh, and that's interesting. I think Dan is one of the only tribes that most of them didn't go to captivity. They were the second biggest tribe of uh, next to Judah. And so it's, it makes sense. It's interesting, man, to, to know that they were – had to do with the sea kings they also had to do with the scythians they were they were a powerful people man there's no doubt about that yeah and they believed themselves to be the kings that lived the divine right and there yep. was also we just threw the word out but we didn't develop the concept the despacini and the despacini this ties into the the grail bloodline they really believed themselves to be the actual descendants of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, which is a big porky. They were just the tribe of Dan. Yep. Now, is there any, we could ask the question, is there any proof to back up the fact that the tribe of Dan actually went to England in this time period? And yes, there is. I'll just read a quick statement here. This is from the book. Uh, I read from it earlier, The End of the Anglo-Saxon Age. This is by Richard Gentry. And on page uh, 164, he says, The records of the plantation of Ulster. By the way, we did a midnight ride on the massacre of the Puritans at this very place in Ulster. But it says, The records of the plantation of Ulster in Ireland record the first important settlements of Israel in Ireland dating back about 2,700 years years. They specifically mentioned the red or scarlet branch of Judah. Uh, hello, we got the red shield of Rothschild. Uh, we got the red garter. We got a lot of symbolism there that just unfolds. Goes on, it says, the symbol of the symbol of Ulster 
a red hand with the scarlet thread tied at the wrist likely dates back to Zara, an ancient Irish record entitled Cursory Proofs lists five equestrian orders of ancient Ireland. Among the five, one was called Krabab Ruda, the Red Branch. Yeah. In, in a book I was reading called Historia Regime Britannia, which is the history of the, the kings of England or Britain, um, back it's interesting how they date things in there, and I'll, I'll be talking about some of this stuff later in one of our later episodes here, but with their dates, they also associate who is king in Jerusalem at the time. And uh, in the second book, I believe, of this, mm -hmm. there there's a discussion about these Danites that come, and they, they're living in the woods because they're, they want to be free. They don't want to be underneath the control of the brutes, uh, the British, and they have a there's like this war war with troy and all of these different things this is going that we're talking long time ago we're talking the time you're talking about here that they were there and there talks about giants being there it talks about all that interesting stuff but it's interesting to me that they associated the time periods with who was king in jerusalem at the time yeah yeah and and we can definitively and factually say that as long as there have been histories written of England, they have been, they have believed themselves to be the, the rulers, not only that, not only that they were of the, the tribe of David, but the rulers of the Israelites yeah. and sitting on the throne of David. Yep. But as we can see, it's a counterfeit and it's an imposter. Now we'll give one more witness. Let everything be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. And there is so much scriptural and historical things to back this up. It is just <laughs> how in the world can you just write it off as just all coincidence? It's just uh, you just can't do it. But it says here, and this is from Hippolytus, and Hippolytus was born also as Irenaeus was in the second century A.D. And he says this is uh, this is on volume five of the Antonicene Fathers. This is on page 207. And he says that it is in reality out of the tribe of Dan, then that that tyrant and king, that dread judge, the son of the devil, is destined to spring and arise. The prophet testifies when he says, Dan shall judge his people as he is also one tribe in Israel. But someone may say that this refers to Samson who sprang from the tribe of Dan and judged the people 20 years. Well, the prophecy had its partial fulfillment in Samson, but its complete fulfillment is reserved for Antichrist. For Jeremiah also speaks to the effect from Dan, we are to hear the sound of the swiftness of his horses, the whole land trembling at the sound of the neighing of the driving of his horses. Another prophet says, he shall gather together all his strength from the east even to the west. They whom he calls and they whom he calls not shall go with him. He shall make the sea white with sails. And this is just so uh, prophetic of England and their sea power. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was just, they ruled the world because of their navy. Yeah, Of his ships, and the plain black with the shields of his armaments. And whosoever shall oppose him in war shall a fall by the sword. Now, once again, we'll reiterate that we are not saying that there's going to be a restoration of Israel, the Israel of God, from finding the lost tribes, but from that tribe of Dan, they're bearing that Nephilim seed and they have borne it into the bloodlines of European royalty. And to this day, uh, they know the riddle. Now, one more text here we'll share with you. This is from the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. For I read in the book of Enoch, the righteous, that you're and this is from the Testament of Dan, that your prince is Satan and that all the spirits of sexual promiscuity and of arrogance devote attention to the sons of Levi in their attempt to observe them closely and cause them to commit sin before the Lord. 
we have so many multiple witnesses from scripture, history, and non-canonical books that the tribe of Dan is the tribe of the serpent. And I, for one, I do believe that when that beast arises, that he will be from this tribe of Dan. I like it, David. Very good, man. I, I, um, uh, I appreciate this research cause this definitely helps in the research that I'm going to be continuing to do as well. And I, and I'm in agreement with you. The tribe of Dan is, is so mysterious. It's almost like a, a, a hidden, hidden tribe, hidden symbolism. Everything about it is so hidden. And now I know why, of course, you know, this is something that they don't want us to understand because in order for, in order for everybody to see, there has to be a counterfeit so good that it's going to be hard for anybody to see it. And Dan is a great counterfeit because you do have, you know, as far as Nazarites go, you know, you're talking about the long hair. This was something Elijah was a Nazarite. Other people were Nazarites too, but then you have it, them uh, also portraying this um, Nazarite vow as well to be, um, empowered as well. And it's interesting, man, because it, it's like that in everything you have it in every religion. There's always a, there's always a counterfeit and yeah, it, without the counterfeit, it would make it easy, but there are so many of them. And that's why, like David said earlier, you have to be empowered by the Holy spirit to really understand this and, and also have a, you have to have a firm line, I think of understanding to believe that the Bible's true in order to actually not be deceived because there's, if you can play off that script that the Bible is true and you can find the truth within the Bible, even if you look at other things and you see some things, you can go back to the Bible and find the actual narrative that is the real narrative. And that's what we try to do in the Midnight Ride. That's uh, that's our main goal because we do like to study everything. We like to read everything we can get our hands on uh, because we want to know. You know, we want to know what we've been hidden from, or what has been hidden. The Bible says, um, surely, you know, the Gentiles will come and say, surely we've inherited lies. Yeah. Um, and this is where we're at right now. We've inherited lies, a lot of them, when it comes to our history, when it comes to all of that stuff, but there's so many lies. And I, I, I really, if you're listening tonight and you're new age, or if you're any kind of other religion in the world, there has to be a truth out there. And I firmly believe that God is so powerful that he can make a word of his true that can stand the test of time. And I really believe that the Bible is that through all my studies that I've read and all the books that I've read, the Bible holds the most weight. It holds the most power. It holds the most truth out of any book, uh, written over time. And this is a collection of books written over thousands of years that all make sense together and all, um, bear a strong, strong power that it is undeniable when you read it. And that's all I want to say about that, David. I want to make sure make it clear because there's a lot of people that are listening tonight that may or may not have read the they may or may not have read the Bible, and of course the church has done a good job of steering people away from reading the Bible and and steering people away from God in general. But I would submit to you that you should read it from start to finish. I think that's that's something that you really need to do to understand this world that we're living in. Um, David, you got any final words before we close well, up here? Well, yeah, and I would say that. In this time right now where we can see the anti-Messiah about to be enthroned and all of these undeniable things pointing to that, the enthronement of the counterfeit, now is the time to receive by faith the one that sits on the throne of David in the third heaven at the right hand of the Father. And anyone out there tonight that you've never prayed to repent of your sins and place your faith in Christ's death upon the cross as payment for your sin debt, to confess him as Lord and to serve him as your Lord. If you have never done that, if you don't know a time in your life where you have definitively prayed to repent and confess Christ as Lord, do that now. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Pray that sinner's prayer. Repent of your sins and profess Jesus is Lord, and you will be saved by the true gospel of the true Messiah, who now is on the real throne of David at the right hand of the Father. And when you do that, give us an email, send us an email there to the Midnight Ride. Let us know so we can pray for you and rejoice with you. Amen to that. And tonight we are ready for the Pounders Pound. That's where we all pound the like button together. David's going to count us down. We're all going to do it on the count of three. 
Um, hopefully this helps with the algorithm. I don't know anymore with YouTube what that helps with the algorithm, but I, but I'll tell you, it helps us. We like to see how many people out there are listening and like it. And, um, there's almost 3000 of you watching right now. So if we can all hit the like button together, that would be great. So let's do it, David. Let's count it down. One, One two, two, three, three. Boom. boom. Yeah. I felt that one. That was good guys. Thank you so much for hitting the like button. Uh, we appreciate you guys so much. Please hit subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure you hit the notifications bell so that you receive us. We we do this every week. Last week we didn't broadcast because we had Pentecost, a big celebration here at the barn. Um, for those of you who are looking to be baptized or just come to fellowship with us, we do have another thing set up coming up. And all you have to do is email uh, NYSTV. Uh, I go to NYSTV org and email support, and you can find out when our next little thing is we're not having a big one open to everybody but if you register to come to get baptized or come to fellowship we are doing that and it's in july so make sure you guys check that out if you are wanting to come to make the pilgrimage to the puritan barn um then please do this is a this is what we're here for so anyways with that being said david end us out as always it is with great thanks to you the midnight ride audience that we, we close this broadcast. We, we thank you so much. We're so thankful to the Lord to enable us to have this platform. And thank you to all the Midnight Ride listeners that we, we couldn't do what we do without you. So with that, until next Saturday night, 10 p.m. Central, high five and good night, everybody, from the Midnight Ride. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up. Rise up.